Speaking of, uh, speaking of improvisation, uh, we're going to do a little improvisation tonight. Uh, and the reason why is, so I, out of the corner of my eye, so what, what I would normally do, and I'm gesticulating to my right, is I would look at the comments. And uh, as you were talking very lovely about, about your story about picking up piano, uh, there was uh, comments about not being able to hear your audio. So this is live. Uh -oh. okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. Your audio is good now. This is user error on my part. Uh, it's called clicking the button that actually sends. Never, never when you and I were talking earlier about, hey, I can control whether your audio goes out. Well, I apparently can control whether your audio goes out. So... <laughs> Um, so I apologize, studio audience. No Pierre started talking uh, beautifully about his exposure to piano. So we're going to ask that question again. Uh, so the question I posed, they heard me, by the way. So they heard my question. And then they just saw okay. me do it. Okay. So anyway, the question is, <laughs> what got you into what got you into music? So, um, so you get to do 2.0 of what okay. got you into music. Now it'll be much better. This will be a better yes. story. I okay. <laughs> so well, basically, um, you know, I started out wanting very young, wanting to play the piano, as many composers do, uh, wanting to play an instrument. Uh, my family actually didn't own an instrument at the time, um, so I used to walk uh, down the street to the local church uh, where the where uh, one of the nuns there was teaching piano lessons. Mm -hmm. And um, she allowed me to come in every day to, to use the piano there to practice. And she also had an assistant who used to, I, I still remember this, I don't know why, but I used to give me flashcards and things like that. Um, were, and that, one, that was when I was like five or six. Were and these like then, the, the typical note flashcards where it'd be like, yeah, this is a quarter names. note and then, or whatever. Yeah, yeah right. And my kids uh, cursed me for that because I used that on them when they were kids, the same flashcards. <laughs> right. So it's like anyway, handing, uh, handing down the punishment. Right. Yes. Right. Um, but, you know, and I took up a little bit of cello. I took up percussion so that I could play in larger ensembles. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but piano was always my main instrument. Um, and uh, you know, I played percussion so I could play in the in the orchestra or in the mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. um, still played some some chamber music, played some jazz, played in some pop rock bands. Mm -hmm. But I had a I had a very traditional sort of classical training, mm -hmm. and just became interested, you know, fairly early on in uh, when I was a kid in writing my own sort of little tunes. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were actual, you know, little pop songs to, mm. and then I started writing sort of in the style of whatever composer I was mm -hmm. studying at that time, mm -hmm. you know, making up little, little tunes. Mm -hmm. um, but the way the process worked for me when I was a kid was I'd memorize a piece mm -hmm. after improvising, uh, you know, for however long, uh, memorize the piece and then write it down. Okay. So that, that right. process has certainly changed for me over the years, especially when you're working with larger ensembles. And right. Things. But um, but yeah, and just growing up, you know, as you know, uh, once you start playing in these larger ensembles, all your friends are musicians. So and then mm -hmm. you form little, you know, other little ensembles from mm -hmm. that. You arrange mm -hmm. pieces or you write pieces. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's how it, and they kind of write a cas cascades and, the, yeah. the, so I, I, I what, what what was it about music that drew you was it just something that you 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 felt like you wanted to do I mean how, how did you even like know that it was a thing uh, that was of interest value or that you were even good at it i mean what was do you do you remember any well a moments? couple things yeah um i didn't really know it was a thing until a little bit later but when i was still at that very young age i, I would say um you know we used to have these family get-togethers and all my aunts and uncles played the guitar or the piano mm. by ear mm. so they would all grab their guitars at these get togethers and we just a whole bunch of us sit around and sing um, both sort of American popular songs, French Canadian mm -hmm. folk songs, mm -hmm. 
uh, both in English and in French. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think that sort of communal music making was just something I felt like was really special. So I, and I always wanted to take part, not just by singing, but being able to play an instrument. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So I think that sort of piqued my interest. Right. Right. That. But later on, you know, um, I think there was a certain creativity in um, wanting to write music when, again, fairly early on, one, one of our neighbors introduced us to the Beatles, <clears throat> who had by then uh, long since broken kind up. But, taken over the yeah, world, right. Yeah. Um, but they had broken up, but their music was still, you know, obviously out there and... Uh, uh, every time my brother and I would be playing wiffle ball out in the yard, we'd be blasting the Beatles. And then a little bit after that, you know, I, I got to know Aaron Copeland's music and we were playing it in orchestra. I was playing it on, on the piano. One of the first pieces I played was, uh, Copeland's the cat and the mouse. Mm, mm. Um, and I always remember that piece, not just because of the piece, but I remember later reading that that was one of his earliest pieces that he wrote when he was in France. And he was approached by, um, I think it was Durand, one of the publishers there, mm -hmm. and sold the piece for like $100 in perpetuity. Just, and that became one of the most popular pieces. And right. he never got anything kind of, kind of like a, back what, from that. So he yeah, got right. smarter after that. Right. And, he, he, uh, he, he apparently he learned he about his copyright. Learned about residuals. Yeah. yeah. Right. But uh, um, yeah, I think with Boozy after that, he, uh, <laughs> he was a little smarter. But anyway, and Copeland was one of those composers who he was really the first concert composer that I knew of mm. that was making a living writing Doing concert the, music yeah and he wrote some film music obviously and other things mm -hmm. but, um, I, I wanted so that was an inspiration yeah i i wanted to uh so uh this this now uh spools back a little bit to uh so so pierre and i were joking a little bit beforehand also about the uh, so his last name I, I before i knew and this is this i have a point by the way to to, to what i'm saying um the uh because you mentioned french uh canadian songs so like i, I was going to say well where did you grow up right where were your you know what was your upbringing and your family background but when i first encountered your music before i knew you i always thought it was gelbert and i had taken french in junior high and high school right so i you know, so I, I at some point, I think when I first introduced myself to you at some point in early, early on, I, 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 I think I introduced you to someone else. And I said, oh, here's Pierre Jalbert. And and, and then at one point you said, that's no, Jalbert. And but you didn't say, I, but then you clarified it later that it was just to make it a little easier with, with for people who maybe didn't have French or something like this, but anyway, so where where did you where did you grow up and and uh... I grew up in Vermont, um, and I actually always point to uh, to you know the state of Vermont. How we say Vermont is act is actually a French word, Vermont, mm. Green Mountains. Vermont, yeah, right. Um, I don't mind if people say Jalbert. I mean, that's the correct Parisian French, you know, mm -hmm. way of saying it. Mm -hmm. um, but my family has, since they've been in the States for quite a few generations, mm -hmm. um, long time ago, started saying Jalbert, unless they were speaking French. I mean, both of my parents uh, do speak some French um, with the sort of French Canadian has a is a little different. It's more like Jean Bai. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I don't mind if people say Jean Bai, yeah. but we've just so, always said uh, Jalbert. Said more the Americanized, way. right? Right. Like we say Vermont, or like we say Des Moines, or Des Moines, or, right? Des Moines, or, uh, or uh, one of my favorites. Is, so I spent a number of years in in the Twin Cities. Uh, when I got my doctorate at Minnesota, and uh, I'm also an amateur astronomer. People who know me know that I'm also an amateur astronomer, and so I kept my telescope 
uh, about an hour and a half away from the Twin Cities, and I would go down to this farm. I, I knew a farmer who was also an amateur astronomer, and he let me keep my telescope there. And this was very near a town called New Prague, but it's not New Prague. I, I, when I first encountered New Prague, and I said to a local, I said, I'm going to go have dinner in New Prague, they, they looked at me like I was crazy. What do you mean, New Prague? I mean, that's what it, <laughs> right? it's New yeah. Prague, right? So I was like, oh, right, right. It's not New Prague, it's New Prague. And I was corrected. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of along those similar lines. We, we, you know, pronunciations change, but all right. So it's kind of back to music. Growing up in Vermont, do you think that that had any influence on your later musical life, having that uh, sort of semi-rural or rural uh, um, upbringing? Well, I think, you know, the... Uh certainly the beauty of the, of hmm. the state. Um, you know, I grew up near Burlington, so it was more of a suburban experience um, place, yeah. but it's, you know, everything's kind of small up there. It's Vermont is basically a collection of small towns, but the art scene up there is very vibrant. So right. I had some really great um, mentors and teachers along the way mm -hmm. um, who encouraged, uh, you know, the creative aspect of what I was doing. So even um, as early as uh, middle school, I had written this piano piece and, uh, you know, my band director came up and said, oh, why don't you uh, arrange that for the band? Mm -hmm. So I did. And that just, you know, those sorts of things uh, mm -hmm. happened a lot. And my piano teacher, Arlene Cleary, uh, really um, was just a powerhouse in the arts and, and uh, a wonderful teacher and and mentor and really encouraged um my creativity uh, all the time so mm. yeah i'm not you know a lot of it depends on the reaction of your elders like if yeah. they're if they sort of scoff and just dismiss mm. it you're mm. probably not going to continue as a kid you know it, whereas right. if they um if they have a positive attitude about it Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll probably continue. Mm -hmm. So, um, when did you know, and this could be a moment or it could be a time or something, that you wanted to be a composer? Uh, and did, were you conscious of like what that meant when you started thinking about that? Yeah, uh, pretty early on, I think by the time I got to high school, I, I knew I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. And again, Copeland mm -hmm. was sort of the um, the role model. Um, and I actually uh, wrote him a letter and got hmm. him to sign. We had the, our youth orchestra was making, a, had a project we were collecting signatures of famous musicians so mm -hmm. uh, i wrote to him and he either his assistant or somebody wrote back to me uh, i assume it was him um with his signature so that was a big inspiration that you know here's a real living composer uh writing concert music mm -hmm. i really didn't know what it would entail later on because i kept you know i i i wanted to be both a pianist and a composer that I was very serious about both of them. And mm -hmm. when I went on to college, I did both, uh, mm. both of those things. But um, yeah, I, I didn't know exactly what would, what would transpire, you know, mm. but I do it was just something I had to do. Yeah. Or I at least had to try. Right. Right. And, uh, none, and nobody in my family was, a, was a musician in terms of, I mean, they all played by ear, but nobody, mm -hmm. nobody had really studied it mm -hmm. um, formally. Although I had a, a great aunt who um, taught, taught piano, but mm -hmm. she was a, uh, she was a sister. She was a nun um, and she taught piano. But other than that, um, you know, I had to, uh, it, it was, it was all a huge mystery to me, but I knew I wanted to try if I wound up, you know, if it wound up not working, then 
mm -hmm. I have to find something else but mm -hmm. I, you know i i wanted to at least give it 100 mm -hmm. at first um so where, where did you go to college what was your so i went to oberlin uh, for undergrad, that's where I did um, study both piano and composition. Mm -hmm. And then um, I went to Penn for grad school, University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should mention that when, I think it was when I was a senior in high school, I first heard George Crumb's Music for a Summer Evening oh, yeah. uh, at a concert, you know, this piece for two pianos and percussion, and mm -hmm. we're just sort of blown away by it. Mm -hmm. And at Oberlin, I discovered he was teaching at Penn. Um, right. So I was like, oh, I have to apply have to and see if there. I can go study with, with them. Right. And they had, uh, you know, a wonderful group of uh, composers there, him and Dick Wernick. Uh, Pardon and, me. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> George... This is live, so <laughs> the yeah. door the doorbell rings. So these anyway. are composers at home, so you know. <laughs> these are we are at home. And there's a, <laughs> apparently a delivery, <laughs> so okay. But uh, and George Rockberg, uh, unfortunately, had just retired at the time. Uh -huh. uh, Jim Primos and Jay Reese, they were all there. Yeah, so right. Great, great group of people. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, to work with there. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you long. did you go straight from undergrad to grad? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened after after grad school? And I I, I also want to talk a little bit more about we'll we'll talk more about sort of the, your musical language and influences and things of this nature because you mentioned, of course, Copeland and you mentioned Crumb, uh, but. Um, Right after you finished at Penn, uh, what what happened to you then? What was well, your... then immediately, like most composers, I was unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there, there, there we go. So you hit the streets. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what I, you know, I had a basically a collection of these tiny little jobs here and there. Uh, so uh, you know, I picked up a, a course teaching, um, you know, one course at Temple University in Philadelphia. I was living in Philly at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I had been teaching kids both uh, private lessons in piano um, and these little theory classes at two schools in Philly, um, Suburban Music School and Settlement Music School. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just picked up what I could, um, where I could, mm -hmm. um, got married, uh, had just gotten married, uh, you know, before I graduated. Um, and then luckily about a year and a half after doing, you know, these odd, uh, odd jobs, teaching everything I could basically, mm -hmm. um, to try to make some sort of living, um, I got a Guggenheim fellowship. And that, so that, that's, that's that pretty was nice to have for a year. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about so much about um, the bills, you know. Right, uh, right. Of course, you still have to worry about that. But it's, sure, uh, sure. At least you have uh, something for, our, for a year. Um, and then your first... And then that ended. And so I went back to being unemployed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... You know, uh, soon after that, um, you know, and all this time I was applying for, for jobs and right. all sorts of different things and still right. writing, you know. Right. Um, at that time, I think one of my projects was writing a string quartet for the Maya Quartet, who were mm. friends of mine from, from college. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I always tell students, you know, it's your friends and your college friends that will be the first champions Yes. Of your music. And yes. that's exactly what it's very true. Happened. Yeah. So uh, you know, continued to write through through all of this. And then a little bit later I I uh, actually got an offer for this position at Rice. Um, and I've been there now twenty two, twenty three years, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've been there ever since. So. And uh, yeah, the um, it's, I mean, a, a Guggenheim is not an 
easy thing to get. So that that certainly said something. And of course, you know, then getting a, a, a tenure track job is also not easy to get. Even even 22 years ago, it's harder now, but it, it wasn't, you know, it was still hard to do. Um, so, you know. Yeah, there was only really a handful of openings, just like now every year. Mm -hmm. And so the, the competition, just like now, is stiff. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. 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 And you just so, have to keep trying. So in other words, you, you just, you just kept trying while you were. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't. Keep trying and, and, and keep somehow try to keep a life in music as, as best you can, you know, when you're first starting out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, by compositional influence influences, uh, again, Copeland being one of, one of your first, uh, compositional influences, and then you said you, you listened to Crumb. Were there other sort of wow moments for you? I mean, I'm sure there are probably many, but things that sort of stand out to you uh, in terms of maybe a piece or a composer that really grabbed your ear and, uh, and maybe even helped potentially move you in some direction that, that you hadn't thought of? Uh, while you were maybe in school or, or somewhere in that early time? Yeah, well, there's so many, you know, mm. um, especially when you hear a composer's music for the first time and you just hadn't heard their music before. And then and, you know, that always, and that still happens to me these days, you know, when I yeah. hear a composer who I had never run across their music before and uh, all of these things. I mean, I think everything we hear is somehow influencing us. Mm -hmm. um, well, one one thing when I was fairly young, uh, still uh, before college, I remember being at a um, uh, with my youth orchestra, and they were playing a video of the Emerson String Quartet, um, and it was basically a documentary about the Emerson String Quartet. And they okay, were playing right. the last movement of the Ravel quartet. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard that piece before. And I was, you know, it's one of those things. It's just like, wow, this is rock and roll. This is, yeah, like this is amazing. really cool. Right. And it's all in five. And it's like, whoa, just blows my mind. <laughs> right. um, uh, so, I mean, that was one, one thing that sort of uh, uh, influenced, influenced mm -hmm. me to keep looking further mm -hmm. and things uh, sort of came full circle in 2010, I think it was. Um, I actually got to write them a piece. Um, and I've worked with the, the cellist who used to play in the group, David Finkel, um, right. a few mm -hmm. times on mm -hmm. pieces too. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's sort of, you know, it's, it's sort of a full circle thing. Um, so yeah, you never know where those those influences are going to come from. Mm -hmm. I think in college, I heard um, Joe Schwantner's music for the first time. Yeah, oh, yeah, uh, right. They did um, Sparrows. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember mm -hmm. um, one of my colleagues, uh, Larry Ratcliffe, mm -hmm. who conducts the orchestra at Rice, was mm -hmm. at the time um, conductor at Oberlin, and they did uh, they did that piece of Schwantner's, and that was another thing that kind of really struck me as right amazingly beautiful yeah yeah um and how would you say like your music has oh, this is a big question it's a loaded question and it's one of those obviously loaded questions how say from the time of your 20s as you were finishing up your studies to to now like how would you characterize the 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 overall the change in your music and we will listen to some music that's relatively recent 2017 uh but do you have any kind of way to reflect on your language yeah it's well especially now that we're all you know and in in lockdown mm -hmm. <laughs> mode. I'm in mm -hmm. Bronxville, New York, by the way. I, I, um, you know, I teach at Rice and our, we have a, a house in Houston, but we have a, you know, a small studio apartment up here in Bronxville. So 
um, yeah, this, you know, this time is sort of an interesting time to mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. what we do as composers and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to sort of reflect on what we've done and, and the whole, obviously the whole music industry is, right. is having to reflect on, mm -hmm. on all of these issues. But in terms of my own music, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think um, when I was in, you know, when I was much younger, um, I think everything revolved around the piano a little bit more for me. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because I was a pianist, mm -hmm. um, as I've gotten older, I, I think I've written more and more away from the piano. I always try to spend, you know, weeks away from the piano, just when I'm first working on a piece mm -hmm. to really think about the piece more abstractly in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and to get beyond also the the equal tempered 12 keys, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. the 12 chromatic keys that you get mm -hmm. on the piano and thinking more about the sounds in between the mm -hmm. keys, whether it's quarter tones or using the harmonic series and the, the flat seventh, flat 11th kind of for mm -hmm. you know, out of equal temperament kinds of tones. Mm -hmm. but actually mm -hmm. the piece uh, we're going to hear uh tonight one of the movements there's a melody that um uses nothing but natural harmonics mm -hmm. and really makes use of those the flat seventh especially mm -hmm. um, but those quote out of tune right um harmonic series tones um uh, those different partials um so yeah, it's it's. I think for me, it's become a little more abstract in a way, um, but I hope still grounded in in everything I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that might be a good segue to to listen to some music, uh, and then we can sort of take it from there. Uh, so. Uh, what we're going to hear uh, this evening is a movement of your uh, piano quintet, the first first movement, and you've already uh, begun to describe a little bit about it. Uh, well, what so... I was describing actually is in the second movement. Oh, but okay. I, I can say a few words about the first. If sure. You want. Yeah. Um, so this movement, th this is a piece uh, written for the Jupiter String Quartet and the pianist is Bernadette Harvey, and they subsequently recorded the piece. It was commissioned um, through the Arizona Friends of Chamber Music, uh, which does a ton of commissioning, um, and, several, and a couple other groups also participated in that, uh, Fort, Fort Worth uh, Chamber Music and the La Jolla uh, Festival. Mm -hmm. So, um, the first movement is called Mannheim Rocket, and it's it's sort of a yeah. pulse-oriented, uh, non-stop, non-relenting. Um, it's a it's a pretty short movement, about three and a half minutes mm -hmm. of um, you know Mannheim Rocket was basically uh, this technique used by 18th century orchestras of these rapidly rising arpeggio or scalar-like figures um, just to create. Um, excitement excitement yeah and you'll hear some of those uh rising figures throughout the the 21st century sort of um take on this is that um i sort of imagined this uh all of these figures um gradually rising uh excitedly until they actually launch you know it is the rocket that launches mm -hmm. into space mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, uh, into the cosmos and right. you get this sort of feeling of hopefully uh, uh, floating around even though the, 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 the pulse continues mm -hmm. great uh, well why don't we uh, check it out and so uh, we're going to I'm going to switch over to the view of the score which everyone should now see and we are going to check out the music and we'll meet you up afterwards
Wow, that was great. Um, so, um, so you did use some harmonics, but not the harmonic sort of melody that you were mentioning. You used quite a quite a bit of harmonics. Um, sure, yeah. Just uh, create this sort of texture in the in the second half of the piece. Exactly. Um, and I'm curious. I, I think I, I would like to hear the second uh, movement, uh, which is. Uh, I think we should we should listen to the second movement. But before we uh, continue to the second movement, um, uh, the and I said this about Lance. I said this about everybody I have on. But I said it about to Lansing. They they use the term well heard. Um, you know everything that and uh, that I've heard of yours is so exquisitely well heard, um, and. Mm, the the choices that you make are are feel like the right choices to me and and it's hard for me to explain that uh to some people who might not know what we're talking about you know what i'm talking about when you t when you yeah. when we talk about you know um and um I guess the, the 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 it brings up a question a little bit about language and and one's own uh, uh, how one perceives language and choice choices because language is about choice uh, ultimately the the syntax and so like when did you uh, know that you were writing music that was yours uh, which which is kind of a question from before but I mean did you have a, a piece or a moment where you said you know this is mine and not say uh, something that's sort of inspired, like you said earlier, you did a lot of like sort of style studies, like improvisations and styles of, right? But at mm -hmm. some point, your voice came out, um, and how you make your decisions come came out. Like, do you do you have a a piece or a moment when you when you realize that hey, this is me? I don't think I had necessarily one piece or one moment, um, but I think I sort of discovered um, at least the track I wanted to go on as a uh, as a grad student. I think the there was a sort of I want to say you know I, I had always been sort of attracted to. to certain kinds of harmonies and certain kinds of long melodic lines that mm. had always been part of what I did. Mm -hmm. I think, I think maybe the, you know, trying, trying to think, um, there are really two pieces. One is this piece I wrote, um, although it's, I still consider it, it's, you know, definitely a student piece. It's not part of my portfolio now, but, um, a piece I did for the Oberlin Contemporary Ensemble when mm -hmm. I was in school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where I really started to get my footing in writing mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. larger groups, mm -hmm. you know. And then when I finally got to to write an orchestra piece as a grad student, um, I think those two uh, pieces were sort of um, breakthrough pieces for me because I not only discovered uh, how at least to start to approach writing for large ensemble, mm. but learn something about my own writing in the process, you know? Right. Um, right. Yeah. There's something about writing for large forces that, that show you something about yourself, you know? Uh, <laughs> right. And cause, cause it's less predictable, you know, right. It's, it's hard to, to predict you know, until you have a lot of experience and even mm -hmm. then it's still hard to predict mm -hmm. exactly what everything is going to sound like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, well, let's listen to the second movement uh, and we can pick up uh, more of this thread uh, um, after we hear some more of this uh, piece. Um, okay. The, I should just say the second movement has a title as well. It's entitled Kyrie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, doesn't quote any particular Gregorian chant, but I this the first three notes you'll hear. Um, da -dee -da -dum, uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, 
I, you know, you could put, you could adapt the words Kyrie to those three notes, mm -hmm. but then it, you know, it develops and goes on into its own, In there. its own sort of thing. But Gregorian chant, I should say, has had a big influence on many of the pieces I've written. Interesting. Um, so, but after you hear this opening, um, you'll hear the cello, um, come in with these very high harmonics. And it's a melodic line that consists of nothing but the harmonic series, mm -hmm. uh, including the so-called out of tune notes. Right, the so seventh and eleventh partials, yeah. Um, great, all right, let's 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 check it out and uh, we'll, we'll meet up afterwards. Okay. Oh.
Wow, that was be really beautiful. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm again struck by a lot of the color, uh, the 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 choices. Um, your harmonic palette is rich and very. Um, it's. It, I've heard a number of works of yours now, and so like I'm starting to get a sense. Um, and by the way, this this is just ref referential, but not like uh, when I say this, I don't mean like your music sounds exactly like somebody else. But if I had to sort of say their, what their ingredients in here, I mean, I'm here some ingredients of Messiaen and Takemitsu. Uh, some of those colors are in there. Uh, but but they're not. They're yours. It's just that you know when um, I hear some of these kinds of of textures, there's a kind of there's a kind of delicacy to the music. Even in your fast music, there's a kind of delicacy uh, that you have. It's it's a it's a it's a it's definitely a skill of of how you orchestrate and how you. Um, choose to pace things and uh it it's not that the music doesn't sound strong i don't i don't mean delicacy in, in any kind of a negative way i just mean it 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 doesn't feel heavy-handed mm. at all well there's there's certainly a um i think many of these french composers like wc Ravel, messiaen mm -hmm. uh, Boutier, you know all mm -hmm. of these guys mm -hmm. um I could keep going. <laughs> had a had a big influence, you know, along the way. Sure. Well, you mentioned so. being hit, struck by the Ravel string quartet, right. young. Yeah. You know, uh, me, me too. I went. I, I when I discovered Ravel, it was it was like having taken a drug, um, <laughs> and I. We all do this. So those of you at home who aren't composers. Usually, what composers do is when we when we discover a composer, as if we as if we discovered something, uh, it becomes like this diet of just you can't get enough. You just get every recording and score you possibly can get your hands on, and it becomes an obsession for like six months or a year on like one composer or a couple composers. So you you know we go through our Ravel phase and our Stravinsky phase and our you know whatever uh, Debussy. Uh, so yeah. Um, uh, Believe it or not, I actually had a Schoenberg phase too. Yeah, so me, uh, me, me too. I mean, yeah. Schoenberg's not <laughs> Schoenberg's not cuddly like Ravel, <laughs> but uh, yeah, right, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, the other thing about your harmony, uh, Lansing. I would say this about Lansing's music too, and and, and a number of composers that I know, um, is it feels that the harmonies and it's not by the way this is not because you're using the harmonics but the harmonies the colors even when the colors are um, meant to kind of blur the these the 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 they feel like they're ground grounded in the way that the harmonic series would choose to reinforce, uh, you know, the, the kind of reinforcement or or negation of of fundamentals, like right? as you grow up, the intervals become less and less, you know, or something along better. those lines. But also yeah. just in terms of tones too, the amplification of of certain overtones and things sonically. And I always, I, I don't, I I don't have a theory on this and I'm not a theorist nor do I have empirical strong empirical evidence but it 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 but the the circumstantial evidence that I seem to have is a lot of composers whose music I gravitate towards have certain similar uh uh, uh grounding in terms of how the 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 how their their Harmonies and the melodies and 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 counterpoint come out of that. Sort of feel like they are in in resonance, and I and I 
and I don't mean resonances and everything is completely brilliant because there are, you know, you can have crunchy dissonances, you can have registral stacks and like blurs, and those those also seem to completely work. Um, um, so your music, uh, I think it just comes back to the well heard part of it, uh, that your music just feels just innately well heard. Um, the, 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 the cello, uh, melody was beautiful. Um, I was, I was in, interested in how you chose to notate, uh, sort of almost explicitly that those tones are kind of out, uh, out of tune, you know, and I put quotes by the way, cause out of tune is a very relative term. Exactly. Uh, I, I tell this every, I begin my opening theory class, like my introduction to like music theory. The very, one of the very first things I say after I introduce myself and hand out the syllabus is I point to the piano and I say, that thing is not in tune. Uh, and then, you know, everybody, you know, the students are like, well, what do you mean? I says, well, it, it is in tune. It was just tuned last week, you know, before the beginning of the semester, but it's still not in tune. And well, that's how I kind of start things off. Um, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, really delicious use of harmonics um, and pacing. And it's actually just just from a practical point, it's actually quite a dangerous uh, thing to write because a lot of those harmonics, you know, are not always they don't always speak exactly mm. the way you want them to. <laughs> right. And, and so it's it's it takes some practice. Right. Uh, especially if you're not used to doing it. Yeah. Um, well, that's true. And not being a string player too, I, I get. You, well, you remember my yeah, Eric, right? Uh, Eric, 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 Eric always yells at me for my harmonics because I always do stupid things like write like third harmonics, and he's always like, "Elliot, don't ever write a third harmonic." It's like, but man, I. I <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, uh, let's let's take a moment and see if we have any. Um, uh, questions from the studio audience uh, while, while we are here. So, um, uh, okay, uh, I don't have any questions at the moment. Uh, studio audience, if you have questions uh, for Pierre, we do have some, um, some comments that came in. Uh, Emily Co. this is beautiful. Uh, Norman Krieger, gorgeous sounds. Um, Kevin, Michael Sullivan, bravo Pierre, lovely work. Uh, Bob Albinger's wow, great work. Uh, oh, Ralph. Hey, Ralph. Ralph Jackson uh, Hi, Ralph. is tuning on in. Um, so uh, David Lipton. Uh, wow. Well, you, you, a lot of people are just really happy that we're doing this and that we're playing music on a Thursday night. <laughs> so, and by the way, you know, it's live. So like the doorbell rings and like for the first five minutes, I don't have your mic on. So, you know, it's great. You know, it's, it's, it's the only thing that's missing is that we're not sitting around, you know, with, with a bottle of wine. Um, but, uh, if anyone has any questions for, for Pierre about anything about the music we've heard about the anything that we're talking about or would have any questions uh, that you would like uh, to have answered. By the way, I, every time I look this way, and I keep saying this because I feel like it looks weird on the camera and I'm not used to this, I'm looking at another monitor and that's where I have all the the, the questions. So uh, don't, 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 I'm not ignoring Pierre or ignoring my audience by doing that. I'm actually trying to pay attention to my audience. Um, so I will keep my eyes peeled for, um, for, for questions that may come in. So, uh, as I stall for maybe some questions, um, but by the way, the performance is beautiful. This is a great yeah. performance. Terrific yeah, performance. Uh, wonderful, wonderful players, uh, Bernadette and the Jupiter Quartet. And they did it, you know, um, several times around. So, uh. Yeah, and then when they were they, you know, went went into the studio to record it, it came out really well. So mm -hmm. that's all you can ask for as a composer, you know. What can it's 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 a nice uh, it's a nice uh, gift at the end of the whole process. You know? Right, right. It it ties into a couple of things, uh, and one of which you said earlier, which is the first of all, uh, and this is the advice that we all give to young composers, which is. Um, uh, 
make friends with performers. And the first thing is make friends with them genuinely. <laughs> Absolutely. Not, yeah. not, not just because, you know, don't buy them pizza because you want them to play your music and you don't actually like them as human beings. But I mean, make a lot of friends and surround yourself. They're really interesting people, you know? And yeah. I mean, fun to be around and you'll right, something. Right. right. You know, it's good to have friends. It's good to have friends. It's always good to have friends, right? <laughs> always good to have drinking buddies. Um, and, uh, but oftentimes, and as you well know, um, you never know in life kind of what happens down the road and and your friends can sometimes become your uh because they first of all they like you as a person and then they're willing to sort of do the ex to go the extra mile for you you know for your art as opposed to somebody who might not know your music or something along these along those lines so um so uh young composers in school or even not in school uh make friends with 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 uh your performers and treat them very definitely treat them well buy them buy them pizza and beer and all that stuff uh, when they when they play your music uh at least at first when there's usually no money involved um because you never know uh what can happen and um uh and then the second thing is just that we are blessed when we have performers, whether whether we've known them for 20 years or we just met them last week, if we have performers who take the music seriously. And you and I have both been on the receiving end of performances of where the performer didn't take the music seriously for whatever reasons. And um, there's nothing more disappointing than a new piece of music, especially a premiere that's played poorly. Uh, and I often think that many new works um, would uh, transmit far better to an audience who doesn't know the music and doesn't maybe know the language and is unfamiliar, whatever. Uh, even complicated music can translate to a to 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 an audience member if it's played with conviction mm -hmm. uh, and played with passion and sincerity i remember hearing when i was younger Earl, uh, elliot carter performances of, by musicians who just tackled that music like it was brahms and they played every note with you know and in and, and, and elliot carter's some of his music is not cuddly and 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 you know uh snuggly music it gets gnarly and it's it can be, you know, a, an onslaught orally. For for an unsuspecting audience member, it can be pretty, you know, daunting. But when you watch the performers play, and they're they're playing it as if as if it's like the thing to play, you can't With help even, yeah. even if you're even if you're completely confused and 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 the music is unfamiliar, you're somehow drawn into the into the performance to the extent that hey, you know what I got to take this really seriously. Maybe this there's something to this music. Um. So. Uh, just absolutely. Well, there's so many issues that come up with that. You know, it's it's. Um, just a couple of thoughts on that. One is, if, even if you don't necessarily have a, a great premiere performance or whatever, mm. if um, sometimes it takes uh, a piece sort of to sink in with with performers, and I know uh, if they get to do it more than once, you know, if they get to do it several times, mm -hmm. the it's just going to get better. And yeah, it's amazing. Right, um, right. I've seen it so many times. What happens at the premiere? Just comparing what happens at the premiere till maybe they do it on another concert. Yeah, you know, a year later or right. something. It's, right. They've lived with it, you know. Yeah. And it's the same when they play the traditional rap. Yeah, absolutely. But the other thing, the other issue is sometimes you know, as composers, we are, um, and I and I'm totally like this. You know, we hear every little detail mm. that we wanted right. to be a certain way. Yeah. And if it's we're all perfectionists, basically. Right. right. But we, we've we've got the score up here and it's a running script. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I tell my students sometimes <laughs> as you know, as you get older you get a little mellower and sometimes even not the greatest performance necessarily can speak to somebody in the audience mm. who doesn't necessarily know the piece. Mm -hmm. Maybe could, you know, 
might have something from that piece may right. have translated, right. yeah. even if it wasn't, you know, exactly what you had in mind. <laughs> right. Um, right. You never but, know. Yeah. 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 So, um, it's a process and, yeah. and, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I love when performers treat new music as if it's old music mm -hmm. and they treat old music as if it's new music, you know, that's the best it, of both worlds. Yeah. It's, there's such a freshness to it mm -hmm. and, a, and, a you know, a conviction to it. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, you, can't, you can't help but be drawn in as a, as a listener. Right. Right. Yeah. I've heard performances of Beethoven piano sonatas played like they were brand new by performers who just took it to task to really bring something extra to it. I'm just the way, and it, and it, and it's like, wow, I've heard this piece a million times and it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's Beethoven. It's fine, but it's kind of like, you know, okay, great. You know, and then it's like, wow, this is like, wow, this is really interesting. Like sounds fresh. Be, it sounds yeah. fresh. It's not like Beethoven yeah. just wrote it yesterday. Um, so, and then, yeah, like you said, the flip side, you, you play a new piece of music as if it's, in the, in the standard rep and it's been played for 150 years um we do have some questions uh popping in here um one is um so kathy says uh how did his family support him in the early years i think probably that means artistically and what are his future plans with composing a couple good questions um so maybe with the first one uh and we we, we touched on it a little bit uh yeah. Um, well, when I was, uh, as I said, when I was first starting uh, trying to learn how to play the piano, we didn't have a piano, so mm -hmm. I would walk down the street to the local uh, to the local church where one of the nuns was a piano teacher and uh, would use her her piano. Um, later on, my parents invested in a little uh, upright piano. Um, uh, and they, they've always been supportive. I, you know, I, I think, um, they didn't really, uh, when I was younger, I'm not so sure they saw music as a healthy career choice, <laughs> put it that way. Right. Um, it's a good way of putting it. Like maybe I can find something <laughs> yeah. else to do, like, uh, be a dentist or be a priest and do it in your spare Just, time. Right. Um, right. Um, but I was going to try no matter what, and uh, at least see what, you know, see what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but they were always, you know, extremely supportive. Mm -hmm. What am I working on now? Um, it was that the second question. Yeah, it was fut about future plans. Uh, it was what, what are his future plans with composing? Yeah. yeah what are your future um, plans with composing? Well, I'm, I'm writing actually uh, my first deck tet. Um, so Whoa. piece for ten, 10 players um, for yeah. this group out in uh, Santa Fe uh -huh. and Albuquerque called the Chatter Ensemble. Um, yeah, and I kind of see this piece as, we'll see whether, um, uh, for me, I'm, I'm since I'm on sabbatical, you know, I'm mm -hmm. trying some new things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we'll see. We'll, we'll see how that how how, how, that how that how that rolls yeah um oh i wanted to also point out uh jonathan newmark um he he met you he 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 says he really yeah he's a composer yeah, we yeah, met composer. at the, uh, yeah. at the uh, chamber music conference in bennington mm -hmm. so he popped on to he's on the youtube channel and said um uh great to hear this piece would like to hear the whole thing uh, yeah, we'd all like to hear the whole thing. We'll we'll find out ways to to get uh, more music uh, from Pierre. I will get links uh, uh, links to to uh, this piece and other and links to his website and things like this. I'll put them in the description. So anybody who would like to explore more of his music will will uh, I'll, I'll make those things available. Um, and he says, hope our paths will cross soon. He was on the uh, I do this weekly kind of Zoom composer sort of hangout type of thing on Wednesday nights. Uh, and uh, he's been on the last couple of weeks and he was pretty excited uh, that you were gonna come on the, the live stream tonight. Um, so, oh, Texu, uh, yeah, Texu Kim, uh, 
writes, wonderful music. Uh, the pieces seem to be seamless. Um, what is the secret? Interesting. He's a composer. Do you know Tetsu? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so he says, uh, does the composer just listen to the music over and over again while composing? It's an interesting question, yeah. Well, that's the thing, um, is getting... For me, it's a lot of it is about not just the musical materials themselves, which are obviously very important, mm -hmm. but um, the timing of events, you know, so that right. something enters just where you need it to. And for that, it's a struggle. You know, I think yeah. uh, maybe for Mozart, it wasn't a struggle, but for the rest of us, it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. um, some, some people uh, have less of a struggle than others, but I know for me, that's what I'm, I'm constantly thinking about um, mm -hmm. as I'm writing. Uh, um, and I have this, in order to get over that and not concentrate too much on four seconds of music, yeah, I have this sort of um, shorthand that I use. Um, oh, yeah. Where... I try to get as much, it's basically a rhythmic and contour shorthand. So you might mm -hmm. actually have bar lines and rhythms and mm -hmm. contours, mm -hmm. but you're not sure of the details yet. Right. But the timing of things is sort of built into that. Yeah. So as yeah. you build up more of the details, um, uh, you know, you can, you can constantly think about that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way for me to get more material down on the page and work with it. Right. That's interesting. I'd, I'd like to sort of talk a more, a little more about that because I, I, for, for those composers who are, uh, doesn't matter, um, what stage of career you're at, uh, doesn't matter whether you've been doing this, like you and I, we've been doing this for, you know, 30 some odd years plus years. Uh, or you're just starting out the issue of like how not only how to take an idea and to go with it but also like when do you change it or when do you do something new or when do you you know like pacing right um and to that end um i do have a document from uh, pierre sent me uh which is uh, kind of an example of this uh which i can uh you watch me struggle with technology for a minute. I can share. So Pierre can't, by the way, Pierre can't see the, the live stream. Uh, so he doesn't know what I'm putting up on the screen. But at the moment, uh, and I'll put our faces up there so they can see us. At the moment, um, my, I'm blocking part of it, but, <laughs> but, I'll try, but it's just a little bit. Um, I'm putting up that, uh, your, uh, your outline, your, the, the sketch outline that you, uh, you, that you sent me. Um, so, so here with, we have, uh, uh, an example of that. Do you, I mean, you know what it looks like. Uh, do you want to say anything about, um, well, I know just you... a couple of things again, for me, I, I, didn't really start doing this until grad school and mm -hmm. even then it's sort of developed over the years you have to it's it's, it's a way of developing an inner ear mm -hmm. and getting at least some material longer stretches of material mm -hmm. down quicker mm -hmm. so then you can go back and really refine it mm -hmm. you, know, you can project certain things you can develop other things mm -hmm. um so this uh I believe this particular sketch is, um, you know, a movement from my cello sonata. Yep. Um, and I think I fit the whole movement on two of these large pages. So that's another thing you can see and, and go through again and again and again. So you basically have it memorized mm -hmm. the whole movement, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and check it for timing and, and, mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things it, and so you can see a, a large chunk of music all at once i think we're so used to um you know looking at smaller computer screens and mm -hmm. um, seeing only a small chunk of the picture yeah the well two two things uh one is uh i i um this is a way of getting to a similar thing what lansing was talking about last week he he when he does this sort of 
process. He takes the sheets, and the sheets aren't necessarily exactly notated. They're just, you know, they can be just sketches or whatever. And he lays them out on the floor and, and kind of like conducts his way through it as a way yeah. of getting to the bigger picture, right? This is just another way of doing it by essentially putting it into a, into a, uh, a, a sort of condensing the canvas, but yet still being able to give you sort of like the, the, the higher sort of Google country view rather than down into the street view right as you zoom in exactly and, out, and right? being able to do that fairly early on in the piece rather than waiting and saying oh this is the end you know after you've written most <laughs> right. of the piece oh i guess this is the end you know right. having that having that sense of what the piece is mm -hmm. and because we work with time right right you know, how long is it um, right right fairly early on in the in the in the process right um, yeah, it's fascinating. I, 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 I heard a, a version of, of you speaking of this, uh, last year in Alba. Um, you, you talked a little bit about this might have even been one of the, the examples you, you showed to talk about your process in terms of, you know, how you think. And you used an interesting term last, uh, 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 uh earlier, you talked about memor memorizing, you said that again. And so... Um, when you talked about when you first started composing and, 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 and working things out, you talked about working things out so that you could almost memorize the, the, the whole thing, uh, the whole piece. And uh, so that process really stuck with you. It, it is part of, I mean, in a sense, like, I'm, I mean, because you said that you, you I mean, Maybe you don't memorize every single detail, right? When you get in there, but but you but you have a pretty good sense of how something goes. Uh, if I if I'm reading you correctly, you have a pretty good sense of how something goes, even before you fire up Sibelius or Finale and start throwing in, you know, specific notes and rhythms. Yeah, yeah. No, I actually I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, the the process when I was a kid is, you know, you make up a piece, you can you memorize it so you can play it. Mm -hmm. And then you write it down, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, whereas now I'm very much working, you know, uh, with the notation the whole time, but mm -hmm. I don't really put anything. It's all in this sort of uh, weird sketch form, you know, until close, closer to the end of the process. So yeah. That, yeah. Um, before I'm really committed to every little single detail i have mm -hmm. i have the bigger picture in mind mm -hmm. um and that I, changes along the way too sure sure i guess it, it also maybe changes in some ways even sometimes some pieces uh some pieces may lend themselves more to one you know engaging maybe earlier with a certain part of this process or or waiting longer Th there's uh, and by the way, uh, uh, for the folks at home, feel free to keep sending in more questions. Uh, we have another uh, nine minutes or so. We, we won't cut right off at nine o'clock necessarily. It's not like we have sponsors and there's no other show on the network that's going to come on at nine. You know, at the top of the hour, we don't have the news. Uh, I suppose I could read the news at the top of the hour, but nobody wants to hear the news. Um, so the this this kind of uh, pre, uh the term pre-composition is often kicked around uh and and uh i use that term and then some people like to say that pre-composition is actually part of composition which it kind of is i mean it is composition we are composing even when we are pre-composing but i think the term really means like before you maybe exactly know that that e flat's a quarter note long or something uh, how how long do you take in the process of thinking about a work, even before you get to this uh, sketch sketching uh, stage of of just sort of throwing out ideas on a page, and maybe even get to a manuscript stage? Uh, long time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, I I tell my students I don't think I'd ever be able to, if I use this process as a student, I wouldn't be able to have 
weekly lessons because I wouldn't have <laughs> right, anything any music. but like hieroglyphics <laughs> to show, you know. Right, what did um, you do? For a month, you know, and it's like, although, although I've suggested that, you know, maybe the, the better process for students might be, because they're in the same boat when they're first starting a piece, you know, mm. you, you're just, you're sort of racking your brain for a few weeks. Um, just get, when you're just getting started that, you know, maybe you should have a few lessons at the beginning of the process and then more and more lessons as you get towards the end of the piece. Cause there's just a lot more to say right. as you get more material. But right. Right. Anyway, that's not how we that's another, it's so not usually how it works in the weekly, <laughs> the weekly, you know, what have you yeah. got for me this week? I usually tell yeah. students to, um, especially when they're starting on a project, uh, my, I encourage them to take time at the beginning and they don't, they can come and see me and have a cup of coffee and we can talk about things, maybe even listen to some other music or whatever, but I don't want them to feel too stressed out about having to bring in, you know, like finished stuff. Uh, <laughs> Like my lessons with Bill Balcom, a lot of times I wouldn't have something so, but that was fine because then it was just, you know, it was, it was an hour with Bill and, uh, and that was usually fun because it was filled with stories about, you know, he and Joan did this. And then when he was in Paris with Mio or whatever, I mean, it was, so I, you still learn something in the process yeah, when productive. you're, it's yeah, productive, it's productive, right? Productive, because you're yeah. there just sort of learning something about history, you know, living history. Um, so there, but you know, everyone's process is a little different. Uh, um, you mentioned Mozart and the rumor is, is that Mozart had worked this stuff out in his head verbatim and just was a copyist, right? I mean, how much of that is really true? We don't entirely know, uh, but that's the, that's, 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 you know, that somehow these pieces got finished in his head. So how much of the pre-composition process he went through, you know, we don't have him, I can't have him on next week to ask him. Um, or um, some composers like to just go right to score. They just like to start working like, they, 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 they just start working almost linearly from on an idea and just start working this way. Um, uh, I've, I've done it a number of different ways, and I don't know if you, if you tried different ways to kind of see what works better for you when you were younger. Yeah, the left to right, you know, writing from left to right straight never really mm -hmm. quite worked for me unless it was a very short piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's especially with longer works. I, um, for me, it was, uh, and still now it's it's sort of about getting different ideas um, almost as building blocks mm -hmm. and then seeing how you can mesh these blocks together. Mm -hmm. um, they may be related, they may not. Right. Do you need a transition or are you just gonna be like Stravinsky and have a clock form and go straight into something else? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's always interesting to sort of, um, to sort of think about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's why I, I like fairly early on to know the the overall parameter of the piece. Um, otherwise, I feel like I'm a little bit swimming blind and yeah, I yeah. Don't know, I don't know where this thing is going to end. Yeah. Oh, uh, um, kind of to that point, when I was first working, first learning how to do any of this. My first composition teacher, Malcolm Payton, uh, actually my second composition, my first composition teacher was Tom, Tom, Tom Lee, Thomas Obo Lee. Um, but Malcolm Payton, um, who was a terrific teacher, I don't know if you ever uh, uh, met Malcolm or not. He studied with Roger Sessions um, and uh, I think a lot of his, his teaching, you know, se Sessions left an indelible imprint on him in terms of how he taught. Um, but he would ask me, he had come into a lesson and I'd be stuck. I'd be stuck on the first measure. I wouldn't be able to get past the first measure. I wouldn't, I, I would be stuck on something. And he would say to me, so, well, how does it end? And I remember the first time he said that to me, 
I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me to think about how something would end before I even really started. Right. Right. That I, I it seems like natural to me to think that way now. Uh, but you know, as, as you know, young composer, it's sort of like, wait, you want me to worry about the, the end of it? I haven't even gotten the starting point yet. <laughs> and, and I, I know, I know why he was, he was asking, he was asking me because that was a way to get out of the box. Yeah. To to get out of the, the 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 frame that was limiting and uh, and to think about the piece as a whole, and uh, I've taken that my question about that when I am teaching is I'll ask a student, um, what's the last sound you hear if you're in the audience and you're listening to the premiere of your piece, and they've just the very last whatever has happened. What's the sound in the reverb? What's the very last sound you hear? Right. Think about that. Right. Think about what whatever what what needs to happen to make that happen. Um, yeah. Another issue that always comes up is you know thinking about. Well, I talked a lot about thinking about the piece abstractly, but mm. also think about what I try to do as well is think about yourself as an audience member. Yes. Um, and what are you hearing? And there are actual people. You know, you're not just writing music in the abstract you're writing for people to play mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what are those performers doing mm -hmm. on stage and what is it you're hearing what's mm -hmm. the result mm -hmm. so that sometimes sort of that visual thing can, can yeah help you too. it can really help yeah i i uh, and and lance and i lansing and i talked about this last week is i i almost imagine because nowadays you can have a GoPro, you know, that can fly around, right? Like a, a drone, on a, a GoPro on a drone. I sort of would do this in my own mind when I would think about a piece of music. I'd go take a walk. And I'm, as I'm walking, I'm actually playing the, the piece in my head, the piece that's not even written. I'm imagining, I, could, I know the performers and say it's a string quartet or whatever. I can, I'm, I'm, seeing the gestures i'm seeing the performers actually play the music um and yeah it, it's not maybe a, a 100 percent photo realistic accurate version of what's happening but there's a there's a kind of movie visualization that helps me imagine how those things can become actualized in 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 real space right I think that's a lot of composers do tend to tend to uh, uh, tend to think that way. They 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 almost visualize the piece in some manner. Uh, we do have a question, another question, uh, and uh, by the way, I wanted to thank Kathy and Texu and Jonathan for their questions too. Oh, yeah, I'll, we have a lot of people who are just chiming in and saying, you know, really great. Uh, uh, you know, the music was was amazing um your your mom commented uh, oh no <laughs> yeah yeah so you know hi mom <laughs> hi hi annette um um so that that was that's nice um it's always nice we uh uh there was a question that I can't I can't find it, but I know it popped up, and I, I peripherally saw it while while you we were talking about something else, and I I think it I I think and maybe we'll uh, if there's no other questions that pop in during this answer, maybe we'll 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 start to wrap things up. Uh, so, sorry, Bruce, we don't have any other mu Bruce says play a little more music, Bruce Lazarus. Uh, we don't have any more queued up right now, um, but I will put links in the description. Um, and and uh, there's there's a lot of uh, Pierre's music you can find and and play. Um, and I'll have you on again also when I learn how to do this. <laughs> when, I, when, when this is when the production values are much higher, and maybe I have a producer. I keep saying I need a producer, right? Because I, I'm trying to like you know do all of these things right. at the same time, yeah. right? So yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Great. Oh, thanks. We're Brian. all we're all learning new skills. We are. With, uh, if you asked me six weeks mandatory ago, skills. <laughs> yeah, totally right. If you asked me six weeks ago if I'd be hosting a live show, I would say what. <laughs> What are you talking about? I've got, I've got stuff to do. Uh, but there was a, the question was, uh, para, to paraphrase, I believe it was something to the, to the extent of what, if any, of your jazz 
you said you mentioned having done a little jazz playing. Um, what was, is the, was there anything uh, from the jazz world, or maybe specifically that, and maybe we'll extend that to the pop world uh, that has um, influenced your music, even if it's um, uh, maybe not obvious. Well, from the jazz world, I think is harmony. You know, yeah. and kind of the, these extended chords, extended tertian harmonies. I know mean, it's used in. Uh, you know, modern classical music too, but mm -hmm. um, I think I was sort of exposed to it more in my jazz playing than I was, <laughs> uh, you know, as a kid, I was, I was playing a lot of Bach and Chopin and some Prokofiev. Mm -hmm. And then I was given a jazz chart, you know, with just just chords, you know, with just the chords, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, I got to figure out these chords. Right. C, C, C major seven sharp. What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah what's exactly. This? And then I was like, wow, this really sounds cool. Um, so, you know, it's certainly expanded my my uh, experience with harmony. Mm -hmm. and in pop music, I think it was, um, you know, rhythm and syncopation, mm -hmm. so somewhat with jazz too, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. um, just the approach to to rhythm mm -hmm. um I, I still think i it's it's sort of intuitive for me i don't follow any sort of system but mm -hmm. it, a lot of it comes from that music um yeah yeah uh, especially the more pulse oriented stuff mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so there, there are some big influences there yeah yeah i i think uh and this I didn't. I think want to say. I didn't want to say that that your that your harmonies when I was when I was talking about your harmony earlier. I didn't want to explicitly say that they sounded like jazz harmonies. Uh, but they're very. You know, some of your voicings and things like this. I was saying, oh wow, you, you you've been list. You know, you you obviously know Bill Evans. Uh, you know, you you know his voicings. You know, or or at least you're familiar with. You know, uh, and. Um, uh, I, I, I say this and, and sometimes it's like a bit of an incendiary bomb, depending on where, where you say this, but, uh, but I, I'll, I'll go ahead and put it, put it out on record. Um, I, I think that it, as you're learning harmony, it all composers who are learning harmony should should know some jazz even if if you don't play it should know jazz because that there's there is a uh there's a there's a richness to the harmonic vocabulary that exists in jazz and especially amongst the uh the the, the great jazz pianists um like bill evans or herbie hancock chick Corea, keith jarrett um and the great jazz composers uh so obviously Duke Ellington, I mean, we all should know Duke. Uh, uh, Absolutely. But yeah. but also uh, like Wayne Shorter. Uh, Wayne Shorter is is uh, for me to, to to me Wayne Shorter is one of those under. We don't talk about Wayne Shorter the way that we should talk about Wayne Shorter in the classical music world because he's a jazz saxophone player. But all of those great tunes that he wrote for Miles and Weather Report. Uh, you know he's a brilliant composer and herbie hancock's a brilliant composer so i mean i i try to bring all of this in and i i think that um composers there if you don't know that world that's a world to to, to know because it will sh it'll it'll help with that what i was saying earlier about the grounding of harmony um and it doesn't mean that you have to write jazz <laughs> that's that's not the point it's not that you have to write music that sounds like jazz right and stylized but there's there's definitely something there well, there's such a richness to the harmony and it's part of the american vernacular I right mean, it's, as a composer especially an american composer um you know it's it's, it's it has to be uh, yeah it will it will do nothing except expand your vocabulary which we should all do as composers right all stretching the vocabulary yeah yeah, yeah. um so if i'll look and see if we have any other comments or questions uh we don't seem to have any other questions coming in at the moment um if you would like to ask some questions and you've missed the, the live stream and you're watching this um 
as a replay, please feel free to to pop them into the uh, into the chat uh, comments, and I will try to forward them to um, Pierre, and uh, we can answer any questions. I'll also try to put links into the descriptions. Um, so I think it's already sort of a little past nine o'clock here. Um, and uh, Pierre, it was wonderful to spend the last hour and a half with you. Um, great. And thanks for having me. It's a great thing you're doing. Uh, it's it's really thank you. Wonderful to to uh, be able to talk shop, uh, even if we're not necessarily drinking coffee. Right, right. We're not. I mean, you know, I do have a mug. It's, it's. I've got some uh, water in here, but, uh, but it looks like I'm drinking coffee. I, you know, I've got the, you know, the, uh, the sort of the host vernacular. What I need is some branding, right? Like this, uh, yeah. uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe some next year. Rising from the. <laughs> yeah. Right. But a little. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, right. Exactly. Um, so uh, again, Pierre, thank you so much uh, for, 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 for joining us. Um, so next week, and I will put the, uh, um, the next week, there we go. Uh, another amazing composer gets to join us next week, uh, Emily Ko. Um, and so I hope you all will join us next week for Emily's uh, uh, visit. And in the meantime, uh, I wish all of you a safe week, uh, practice responsible social distancing, and uh, please all take care of yourselves. And if you have any questions or, or, or for me or for Pierre, feel free to, to ask at any time in the comments. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye-bye.